This is iFanboy Pick of the Week, number 744, brought to you by Mac Weldon. Go to MacWeldon.com slash iFanboy for 20% off your first order. And iFanboy listeners just like you, washing their hands, wearing their masks, thinking about other people, and uh, getting through this. Hello, welcome to iFanboy Pick of the Week, episode 744. I am Josh Flanagan. I am here with Connor Kilpatrick. Good morning. Good morning. We are iFanboy, and every week we read our stock of comic books, and one of us picks the one they liked, but I don't know why I said good morning like that. <laughs> and through the whole next part of the reading, I, I was thinking about it, and I was like, I'm going to lose my place, so I just decided to get in front of that. Uh, one of us picks the one they liked best, and we call that the pick of the week. We will talk about that book. We will talk about other books from the week. We will do the patron pick. We will do some listener mail if we have time, and we will give out ridiculous powers that are starting to feel repetitive. <laughs> it will be fun. Even the repetitiveness of those powers will be fun. I have a new one. I, have a, okay. I think it's totally original. Yeah, I think I had an original one last week, and so this week, who knows? I certainly haven't prepared for it. Mm -hmm. There will be spoilers. I just spoiled a little bit of the show <laughs> in the on the books, though, so you know how that works. If you haven't read them, come back. This week, Connor has the pick. I do, and it was a weird week. Yes, it was. I was reading my books... And I read Hawkman 26 fairly early on in the stack. And if you know my habits, that means I wasn't super excited for it. I've been enjoying Hawkman. But, you know, it's like one of those books where I like it, but it's it's never going to be like in the pick discussion usually. So that's the book I read early on. And I read it and I was like, can I make Hawkman the pick of the week? <laughs> and, I, and I thought, well, there's, there's a lot of books left. So it probably won't be. Yeah. And I kept going, and then I, at one point I almost texted you like, oh, man, I have like five books left, and I don't know what to do, but I didn't. And I kept reading, and then I finished my stack, and I was like, shit, I think Hawkman's the pick of the week. So that's where we are. Hawkman 26, Robert Venditti, Fernando Pissarin, Eau Claire Albert, Wade Von Grabadger, Jeremy yes. Cox, Rob Lee. Those are your creative teams. This is the pick of the week for several reasons that are not necessarily all because of what happened in the book. I'm a longtime Hawkman fan. I usually read Hawkman's books, no matter the quality. And this has been a solid, solid book. And and to be like, in case you're not paying attention, when he says no matter the quality, there's some depths, my friends. Yeah. And it's disappointing depths. It's like, okay, Jeff Johns is going to come, come along and fix this. Oh, no, what has happened? It was okay. So the, really the death of the Hawkman, that was bad. Many years ago, and eventually you'll get to see it again. I did a mini on Hawkman and why... He's so screwed up and how disappointing that is. And basically it comes down to the fact that there's only one Hawkman story, apparently, according to the people mm -hmm. making comics. And that story is to constantly and over and over again mine his past lives and how that's affecting him and, and, and just keep talking about his past lives over and over and over again. And it's gotten really boring after about 30 years of that. That's like uh, like Moon Knight and yeah. his like multiple personalities. It's right. like they keep doing it and... So this particular story arc, which is is called Hawks Eternal, has been like the uber explanation or ex exploration of that, in that it's been revealed in this particular storyline for this particular version of Hawkman that his original identity, he was like this galactic murderer. Like he was like the galactic henchman for this like uh, space Hitler. And he killed like millions of people. And when he died, some god said, you have to atone for all these murders and you're going to keep reincarnating until you save the same number of people that you've murdered, right? So that's been mm -hmm. his, that's been this version of Hawkman is that he's re reincarnating because his penance is to save as many people as he murdered, maybe a billion people, I don't know, it's a lot of people. And so in this story arc, he's been coming up against this, his old lives and the gods and all that stuff. And, you know, Shiara Hall came back and that's been cool because she's been sort of sidelined for, um, for the, the newer Hawk girl from recent times, whose name I can't remember at the moment. But she's the classic Hawk, Hawk girl, Hawk, she's one from the cartoon. So it's been fine. The art's been good for Nana Pissar, it's like a really solid DC style artist. In this issue, which is the conclusion of the storyline, this angry, vengeful guy who's got like bone wings and bones coming out of his head has Hawk, man, and Hawk girl captured, and he says he's going to suck out their past life forces to feed himself and so he starts like sucking out old versions of them into his body and I was like whoa wait a minute and then they die there's a sad moment where Ray Palmer and Adam Strange find the bodies and they're really sad because they're they're all buddies and we see them in the afterlife standing on all these skulls 
and the original god that sent Hawkman on his quest for reincarnation to atone says, hey, you can live in peace now, although peace apparently is to live amongst a billion skulls, which doesn't seem all that nice. Or you can go back to Earth, and you'll never reincarnate again, and you, you, you're just you. You have no past lives. And they choose to do that. And then something happens, I'm going to get to in a second, but I've been asking for this for years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a nobody, but I've been asking... Please just wipe away the the reincarnated Hawkeye. I just tell Hawkeye stories that don't involve him being angsty about reincarnation. Just just wipe the slate clean, and that's what they've done here. So really, this is partially the pick of the week because they finally did that, hopefully, from what they're telling the stories. They finally wiped away Hawkeye's angsty, I've been reincarnated forever and ever, I'm looking for my true love every time. It's You just said Hawkeye. I did say Hawkeye. Hawkman's. It seems they've finally gotten rid of the baggage, hopefully. That seems to be the whole point of the story. And I was really happy and excited for that. And then, so they go back together and they reappear in, back on Earth in their modern Hawkman, Hawk Girl costumes. And they're, they're hugging and you see a off-camera word balloon that says Carter, Shiera. And we pull back and this is the last page cliffhanger. And it says, next, the golden age in the, in the old logo that we, we just talked about a couple episodes ago. And it's Jay Garrick and Alan Scott and Sandman and Wildcat. And they're in the Justice Society headquarters. And so this is the, yet another step in the return of the Justice Society. But now they seem to be put back into their original 1940s. That's the best version of them. The original 1940s version of them back with the Justice Society. Yeah, and it's a, it's a stripped down team. Like it's yeah. just the four of them. So did you check this out? I was going to read it and I didn't get to it, but I'm looking at it right now. So their wings go into the little things in their back? Yeah, that's dumb. Sorry. I'm no, sorry. that's dumb. I don't like that. They should just um, be, they should just have the wing things, but yeah, that, just deal with it. Well, I hope that it sticks. I do too, because it honestly, it's been so like comically repetitive. You know, sure. in the same way, and we're going to talk about Wonder Woman too for similar reasons. The same way that Wonder Woman, they can't tell a story that's not about her struggle with the gods. They yeah. can't just tell a, like a Wonder Woman superhero story. It's like Hawkman's not been able to tell a story, other than the team ups with Adam Strange, which is, it's mostly been about the Duran Thanagarian War, mm-hmm. that doesn't just revolve around. The reincarnation. It's like, if you can't tell another Hawkman story, I get why you have to publish the book for legal reasons, but, I mean, like, what's the point if you're just telling the same story over and over for decades? Mm -hmm. And so hopefully, hopefully we can just get some different kind of Hawkman stories going forward. And that's really what excited me about this issue was I was was reading it going, oh, my God, are they they doing this? And they kept Mm -hmm. building and building. And it was a really good moment. So when when the Adam and Adam Strange show up to save them and they're too late, it was really sad. Yeah. And then the end was triumphant, and I was like, oh, shit, Justice Society. And it was like their classic costumes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cool. I have some comments. Yeah. I know the name Fernando Passarin, mm-hmm. a Spanish comic book artist. I really like his work. Yeah, it's good. It's real solid. It's really nice. And I was, I was sort of looking, clean. While, while you were talking, I was looking to see sort of what he'd done before. And it, it looks mostly like a, a lot of sort of fill-ins. Yeah, you know, like or, or small arcs or like miniseries or something like that. But I think he's definitely got something in the in the uh, in the Gary Frank vein. He also has a dash of um, Brian Hitch, at least in the way that he in the yeah. way that the Adam looks. But you know, like the the picture of the field of skulls, mm-hmm. it's like it's a really nice composition. Actually, the page before that, where the Adam and Adam Strange are are looking at their their bodies and. I don't know. It has a real nice graphic flow to it. Like if you look, as the 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 hawks are on the ground, and mm-hmm. then the Adam is sort of bent over, and then Adam Strange is standing. It's a nice triangular com- composition. Yeah, it really is. It's a nice bit, and it sort of you know it moves up as you go. Uh, you know, the page before that, there's all those sort of other people standing there. You know, he doesn't have the same uh, technology that they have to put crowds in the Lord of the Rings. So right. he's got to draw all those people. Right. And then lastly, I'm going to say something. Mm-hmm. I don't hate. Adam Strange's new costume. <laughs> I, you know, I don't think it's as good as the other one, but I like it. He's got the boots. Is this like the one that? Yeah, this is not the old one. He's he got short sleeves. And... Yeah, I know it's not the old one, but it's is like is this actually like what it looks like in most books? This is what it is in the the Tom King Mitch Garrett's book. I think. Yeah, it works. I don't I don't hate it. He's still got a fin on his helmet, so and he's got a big silly uh, jetpack. <laughs> And he's got Captain America boots for some reason. I know. I know. Maybe that was what got me. I was like, well, wait a minute. The boots and the gloves don't really fit their design. Yeah. They're gold. But I was sort of just stunned that they were finally doing this. I understand that. And then the reveal, I was like, oh, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. 
and I don't want to qualify the pick because I did really enjoy it and the art's really good, but in a week where nothing else really jumped out, mm-hmm. I was like, wow, I'm still thinking about Hawkman and what's going to happen next and how they're finally doing something new with Hawkman, hopefully. And now they could pull the rug out from under me and I, this could all be a lie. But for this moment in time, yeah, I'm actually excited about where they could take Hawkman. Because he's, he's one of the foundational characters. He's been around since the 40s. And he's also one of those characters that when you're a little kid... He's awesome. You say you sort of see him for the first time, and you're like, "Yeah." You're telling me you can't tell a story with a guy who wears giant wings, has an awesome bird costume, and has a giant mace that he uses to bash people in the face with. That's just what I want. I don't need 20 years of angsty Hawkman. Just have him bash dudes in the face with the mace. You know, it's funny. A really long time ago, I was in San Diego. I don't remember what the panel was, but I I had some sort of DC writers panel, and I know that Judd Winnick was on it, and someone stood up to ask about the there was the Justice League cartoon, mm-hmm. you know, and yep. and basically the person and I think we know where this person ended up in life had asked like why does it have to be John Stewart as Green Lantern and Hawk Girl instead of Hawkman, you know, on the show and not whatever. And Judd was like, you know, it doesn't matter one way or the other, but you got a girl and she has wings and a big mace and she hits people with it. What is wrong with that? And it always sticks in my mind when I think of these characters. Like, yeah, you know what? It's a, it's a character. And, you know, that person was obviously a sexist and racist person. But Judd did sort of, you know, bring it down to the essentials there. It's cool. It's a cool yeah. concept. And there's a lot you can do with it. But it, they need to be actually try. And hopefully that's what they're going to do here. I don't know if I missed this when you said it. But I realized when you were talking that I was like, wait a minute. There's the resurrection thing. And then there's the Thanagar thing, and I assume that there's been a lot of time trying to reconcile those. Yeah, so this arc basically said that he's been resurrecting across time and space. Okay. So there was like a Kryptonian version. Mm-hmm. And then there's the Thanagar. So like, you know, the classic Golden Age version is a similar concept they've used of the archaeologist who stumbles upon the relic who becomes Hawkman. That's, okay, so... Th- but there's, there's no- also been... Then he was retconned at some point to become a, an alien from Thanagar. Right. And so... You know, they try to reconcile all that. And my whole thing is just pick a lane. I don't really care which lane you pick. Yeah. Just pick one of them and stick with it. So this, this version that we have at the end, is there Thanagar involved? I know they're it's not going to It's hard to say. We okay, don't know. Okay, so we don't know yet. We don't know which what's happening. Because at the same time, Thanagar is a part of the DCU as yeah. it exists now. So <laughs> it's not like it doesn't... And, it, and then I guess they're the link to it. Erased from existence. Erased from existence. I don't know. That's what we're going to find out. I just, I, I, like, I think I even said it on the mini. It's like, just pick one Hawkman and go mm-hmm. with it. You know, yeah. don't try to reconcile it. It's never going to make sense. There's two, it's too different. That, I've heard that. And it's just go with one. And hopefully that's what they're going to do here moving forward. Very cool. Similarly, The Flash, Joshua Williamson, Rafa Sandoval, Scott Collins. Almost the same exact final beat. I know mm-hmm. you're not reading this anymore. No. But um, this is part one of Finish Line. And I think this might actually be Josh Williamson's final arc. From what he's I've been, read, he's done a lot of issues, and this has been, and this is only part one. But the issue before this was good. This, you know, the, the thing with the Flash is that sometimes it's been really good, and sometimes it's not been really good. And so that's been the the, cha- the chance you've taken. And here, the setup is that the Reverse Flash has taken over Barry's body using the Speed Force somehow. It's gobbled go. It doesn't make sense. It's fine. It's it's that feels, Flash science. That feels familiar. I will right away. I'm like, eh, okay. And so he's running around being the Flash. So all he really wants to be, right? That's Reverse Flash's whole thing is that he just really lo- loves the flash mm-hmm. and kind of wanted to be him but in in like that crazy fan way he became evil yep. and so here he finally gets to be barry allen he's running around in his life you know he impulses back through young justice so he goes and he gets impulses and says, hey let's have adventures together but the problem is he's kind of an asshole meanwhile mm-hmm. barry's in the speed force and that part is all drawn by scott collins and he runs into max mercury and jesse quick and so it's a strange amalgam of that run of the book with Max Mercury and Jesse Quick and then also Barry Allen so they kind of meet and they kind of know who each, who each other are but not really mm-hmm. and he, he needs their help to, to get out and it was a really good issue in which eventually the jig is up and Impulse is like you are not Barry Allen I don't know what's going on here but you're not my grandfather and so they have a conflict over that we, meanwhile Barry's trying to get out of the Speed Force and then at the end that boot to the face on that page is fantastic yeah and then at the end, Jay Garrick shows up. And I'm just like, they're, they're back. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. I don't know what's going on in DC Universe. And we're going to get to that later on. But like, 
I actually read these in a row. I always read Hawkeye uh-huh. and Flash in a row. And so two comics in a row, I had the final page beat was the Justice Society showing up to save the day. And I was like, yes. You know, it's it's true. Like if that if that you know, like a lot of times we're like, I don't know what's going on in DC doing this thing, but this is the opposite. Mm-hmm. It's you know, okay, you fired a bunch of people and probably gutted single issue comics, but Justice Society <laughs> in their old costume, I can I can forgive a lot. Yeah, no, it's exactly. <laughs> Um, so that was, I actually really like this. this if, if this is the final arc, I don't know for sure, but that's just what I read online, and I don't read a lot online, so I didn't really look into it. It's been all over the place this book, but when it's been good, it's been good, and this has been this is was a good issue. Did you read the Green Lantern season two number six? I think I did. I mean, I know I read it, but <laughs> I think I liked it. I, I I can't say for sure with this. Season two, we've talked about it before. It's been all over the map, but I think I liked it, and I think it's because it was relatively straightforward in that it was like Hal's in the hospital, this galactic yeah. hospital, and there's like an attack on it. It was just like it wasn't like some strange mi- mi- microverse, and there wasn't like strange. It didn't feel like I was on LSD while I was reading it. It was like mm, a little, like it was like the next day, just enough. Yeah, and but it was like it was like a siege, ep- you know, issue episode story. It was like. This is a, there's a siege happening. Hal's hurt, but he has to sort of suck it up and to save the day. He doesn't have his own ring. He has a different ring, and that ring, ha, you know, is used to different kind of stuff. Hal mm-hmm. just wants to make fists. This ring is like really bored by the fists. I don't know how I feel about giving the rings personalities, but if you're gonna do it, at least do something interesting with it. Mm-hmm. And then there was a lion character, which was interesting. It was fun. And then Hal dies at the end, <laughs> and it says, "How does it feel to be dead?" And he goes again. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't know, this book is so weird. Yeah, I I never know what I'm gonna get when I start it. And it looks really good. And there's there's parts of it, well yeah I'm gonna I'll get to that in one second. Actually I meant to say that about the Flash that also looked really good. Yeah, except the, the Scott the Scott Collins parts were a little weak. Yeah, like I, I start the issue and I I kind of I kind of like brace my teeth and like turn you know like turn my head for the punch you know mm-hmm. like all right let's see what's gonna happen. And then, you know, after a little, I'm like, okay, I understand this concept. Mm-hmm. You know, that helps. There's a lot of silly stuff going on. I really like that shard guy who's, who calls himself this growth or this outgrowth. I think that's funny. He's just a shard. I didn't love all of it, but there was lots of things in here to like, if that makes sense, I think. You have this weird lion character. <laughs> it's just very strange. Yeah. But for me, I think the story of this whole thing was, I mean, basically it's an anthology. At the end of the day, and I don't think that I... Well, there's been some arcs. Yeah, but they kind of let go of it. Yeah. So, you know, in that way, it's, you know, it's an anthology and some stories are longer than others. And that's fine. Liam Sharp, though, is the story of this. The amount of visual imagination here is, is and, and And, it, like, changing styles and sort of doing a ton of things. This guy, it's kind of like, oh, you can do anything. Like, mm-hmm. I, if you think about what is being written here and how many folks could hang with that Mm -hmm. that that does not seem like a long list to me you know like this sort of amount of flexibility and range that that liam sharp seems to be able to do is pretty mind-boggling i Mm. think so that's been really fun to sort of discover i know he's not new he's been around uh comics for a long time and that that's good but you know for me uh, you know it's it's really fun to watch him do this and and I've I've really liked that. I want to give a call out to Steve Wands, the letter. Although now that I think about it, he probably did not hand letter this. But there's one character who talks backwards, like literally the letters are backwards. And I thought that must have been annoying. But then I feel like he probably just swapped the <laughs> file and did it that way. But for a second there, I was really impressed. <laughs> I have a problem with those kind of things. You hate lettering that's like that. Yes, no, I know. But like I understand that like with this and like with Zatanna, there's a reason for it. It's mm-hmm. just it's I don't like I just don't like anything that's like slows down the flow of something like if you were watching a movie and i know this is different it's it's it it may not make sense but if you were watching a movie and when a character talked different all of a sudden you had to slow down Mm -hmm. and rewind it and go through the thing it just sort of disrupts the pace of of sort of reading the story Mm -hmm. um just to understand it because i wanted to understand then after a little while i realized that the guy was just saying words over and over and so it didn't really matter what he was saying i got the gist Mm um yeah so i it it was in the in the spectrum of this particular season, it was one of the more enjoyable issues, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll give you that. So we got some answers in the Amazing Spider-Man Forty Six. Yeah. It's Nick Spencer, Marcelo Ferreira. So none of these villains that Senator is shooting are dying. They are having their 
sort of sins removed, their evilness, their aggression. So they become sort of neutered versions of themselves. That's why Overdrive popped up at the end of the last issue. It wasn't dead. So here there's an attack, Count Nefaria and Grey Gargoyle, one of our favorites, and some other Whirlwind. C-level Love characters. Whirlwind. And Sinister shoots all of them with his shotgun, and the crowd applauds. Yeah, that was the most interesting thing for me, because there was, uh, I think it was like there was interviews, right? Yeah. Like, like media interviews with the people who were there. And, and you know, Spider-Man, it's, it's really interesting. Spider-Man is basically like, so this is what they want now, which is a very um Right, because people don't know that they're social. not dead. He, they just see this guy yeah. blowing these villains with shotguns, and they think Kick an ass, killed them, them. Yeah. eye for an eye. And uh, Spider-Man's disheartened by that, that development. Yes. Just a little bit of media uh, so should, commentary. And so should we all be. <laughs> that was good. But, like, there were a lot of really interesting things here. I don't know that it was entertaining. It feels like a different book now than it was. The first person part was a little jarring. I, I just don't even mean, like, the entire tone of sort of where we started with... Nick Spencer with Humberto Ramos and Ryan and, Otley, uh, and, Ryan Otley. Yeah. and and now like the tone of it has shifted both art wise and I don't know like it's not it's, it's not, not as, as fun it's not as you goofy had, yeah no and I, I really like the goofy yeah. part that, I thought that was really fun from the sort of hyper melodrama sixty stuff that Dan Slott was doing that I wasn't super into and now we're the, after the Craven bit like it's turned into like nineties Spider Man again mm-hmm. where everything's really heavy. There's funny stuff. There's social stuff that's interesting. The bit with Nefaria talking to the reporter, you know, you know, and, the, and you know, like Norman Osborn, like running the asylum is mm-hmm. is a goofy old comic book thing. Right. You know, but it did. It definitely has lost a. He was the patient, but now he's in charge. Like within a week, <laughs> which is, you know, funny and silly and totally not realistic. And, and that's OK. But I think it's lost a step of fun for me, for sure. Yeah, it's not. It's not nearly as funny as it was. It, it, it sort of felt like I think we're talking about like the fix with Spider Man. You know, I was loving like Boomerang yeah. being in that story. I thought that was that was great. This you know this. I mean, okay, it, it it shows you that that Nick Spencer has a lot of range, but I already knew that. But mm-hmm. I, I feel like he's a lot better at the other thing than he is at this thing. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I didn't dislike it. I liked this issue. It's just it was. I'm just trying to figure out what what's happening here. I was having a lot of fun with it for a, it was the first time I was really enjoying an amazing Spider-Man book for a while. Mm-hmm. And if this was what that book was, I wouldn't have read it. Yeah. I get you. And let's take a minute and listen, we're going to try to control ourselves here. <laughs> uh, but when you like a product, we can't help it. We can't help it. And then we got other product mm-hmm. that we have to talk about. So we're going to anyway, Mac Weldon is sponsoring the show. I know what you guys are thinking. But you know, all, if nothing else, we're very sincere. Yep. Uh, that is a premium men's essentials brand. They believe in smart design, premium fabrics. It is better than whatever it is you're wearing right now, except for me, who is wearing it, and therefore it is as good as the thing I have currently on me. They offer industry-leading underwear, but there's so much more than just underwear. They, they're really one-stop shop for men's basics of all kind, which is a phrase that I've never used for my things, but it, it's true. Men's basics. <laughs> And <laughs> they, this, they were talking about socks, shirts, hoodies, underwear, Vesper polos. I don't know what a Vesper polo is. I'm just going to let you know. It's a sexier kind of polo, I think. Okay. Uh, and four-way active shorts, which Connor knows more about. Yeah. Longest lasting, highest quality items on the market. Totally worth it. They believe in smart design, premium fabrics, simple shopping, website. You're, you're not going to have a problem with a website. Works, works great. You'll find what you need. It will be the most comfortable underwear, socks, shirts, undershirts, hoodies, and sweatpants, and more that you will ever wear. So far, that is correct in my experience. There's the silver underwear and shirts that are naturally antimicrobial, which means they eliminate odor. And let's say, for example, that it is the middle of a really hot summer and you can't go anywhere. (laughs) And you can start to see the benefit of something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, They want you to be comfortable. If you do not like your first pair of underwear, you keep it and they will still refund you. No questions asked. Not only do the underwear, socks, and shirts look good, they perform really well, too. It's good for working out, going to work, going on a date, just everyday (laughs) life. I know, like, that part's not aging as well at the moment. But they will be. That's the point. You will be ready once those things return. In fact, by going sort of low-key on your activity now, they'll probably be as good as new Yes. at the point that you can go back to it. So it'll, it'll be just as good. So just be prepared for that. But in the meantime, you can also be comfortable. <laughs> and also, uh, there is a loyalty program. And I have taken advantage of this loyalty program, and it is fantastic. 
It's called the Weldon Blue. Level one gets you free shipping for life. And once you reach level two by spending $200 concurrently, like like not all at once, just $200 altogether, Mac Weldon will start giving you 20% off every order for the next year. That's great. I, that's great. That's, that's I really, great. I like that a as, a, as a program. Feature. Yeah. And Connor and I got some new stuff from them. Yeah. And we, we I have, I've been, every week, I have, we have a spreadsheet that says what ad we have to do in a given week. And I'm like, when's Mac Weldon? Okay, it's next week. We can talk about it. Well, last time we talked about Mac Weldon, I had, my stuff was like arriving the next day. And, and yeah. it did. I think I had gotten mine the day before. So we talked about my swimsuit before. So yeah, so we both got the same swimsuit, which is very comfortable. Which I'll, I'll sometimes just wear the swimsuits around the house because it's you know they're they're nice and comfortable and fewer layers when it's hot. Sure. So this time I went all shorts because it, it's summertime and and now it's all about athleisure because we're all home all the time not doing anything. Athleisure sounds like <laughs> like a disease. Of, so, oh, he's got he's got athleisure disease. Oh no. And also, you know, working out at home now, too, so I needed more workout clothes. So I got the workout shorts, which are nice and comfortable. I got the, the gray color, and they have some nice breathing strips on the side, and they've got pockets, which I think are essential for working out, because you want to carry, for my instance, my phone, so it tracks my movements, and they're really nice shorts. In fact, I, I have them ready to go. I just, just did laundry last night, so I've got them ready to, to go to wear again. And then finally, I got the uh, the four-way activewear short, which is uh, sort of the short version of the radius pant, which we've talked about in the past which is the pant that goes from it can go from formal to informal in a, in, a, in a flash you can wear it hiking like josh does you can wear it out in the world they look nice they're, but they're also comfortable and they have they give and they have elastic waistbands and this is just the short version of it and th- those are really nice too so i'm really excited to have as we enter sort of the hot period which may or may not ever stop to have three more really comfortable pairs of shorts to wear at home has been great yeah those are all good things it's fine but my big discovery i'm not i'm not even but I got some of the Airnet boxers, hmm. boxer briefs, actually. Mm-hmm. And previously, I thought, I don't want that. I don't know. For whatever reason, I don't, I was getting the 24 hours. I like those. Those are good. I'd had some of the silver ones. Those are fine. It's been very hot on the yeah. East Coast. Mm-hmm. And the Airnet... What do they do? What does that mean? They're very light, and they're very breathable, and they're just a little more soft and flexible, but without being loose. Mm-hmm. It just feels like less on you. Mm-hmm. If you follow me. And like, so when it's, I've been saving them for like the really hot days, you know, because it just, it's a little more like just cooling and, and, you know, unburdened by sort of layers of fabric or anything. So it's been, they've been really, I'm going to, I'm going to order some more because they've been fantastic. That's great. uh, Through this time. I'm very excited about those. So now I've done all three of their major types of underwear. I believe there's an Airnet Plus as well. Actually, no. And then there's a, like a special, like a pro that's also more like athletic, or you can wear them under the swimsuit. Uh, look them up. You'll see which ones they are in there uh, that are also pretty good. So 20% off the first order. They have the free shipping for life when you, when you hit the loyalty program, and they got 20, 20% off all orders over 200. You can't go wrong. MacWeldon.com slash iFanboy. Promo code iFanboy. Over at Image, mm-hmm. uh, we got a new book this week from Jason Howard. You may remember Jason Howard from The Astounding Wolfman, mm-hmm. um, where he had kind of uh, a more like cartoony animated style. And then later he did Trees, um, right. where he went to more of a sort of, I want to say scratchy. Yeah, harder little, little scratchy, yeah. Yeah, uh, a little, little rougher. Yeah. And, and he's sort of stuck with that um, for this, this new, new book, Big Girls. I'm going to try to explain it. It's, it's a post-apocalyptic story where the cities have to be enclosed in safe zones because some shit has gone down. And the, the, the boys, a lot, many of the boys, young boys, are turning into sort of like giants or like, like a monsters. little kaiju, a little yeah. monstery thing. It seems as if they evolve into these sort of, I don't say H.R. Geiger, but they're sort of these like uh, War of the Worlds-esque monster yeah. creatures. And they're giants, so they yeah, can smash gigantic. cities and stuff yeah. like that. It's actually really similar to... What was the Chelsea Kane book? Man Eaters. Man Eaters. Exactly it's a that. little. It's a little like that. And so, but in this one, the the some of the women when they're girls, they also become giants, but they don't mutate into monsters. Right. And so it's about the, and so the, they protect the city, and then you've got a program where you know they have to hunt down and find any boys who are turning into these things. Not unlike the Panthers over in, in Man Eaters. It was very similar to Man Eaters. Yeah, but also like in concept, but not necessarily in execution. Yeah, concept. no, it's not as satirical and right. socially commentary like straight sci-fi. 
I thought it looked really good. Yeah. I really like the way great. that his his art has developed. I like that. I think this is the first thing that he's written and drawn. You said, uh, yeah, you said it, that in the back, yeah. And it's not, you know, it's not bad for that. I don't think it's the greatest thing ever, but as far as the sort of, you know, high concept stuff that's come through, I was I was a little I was interested. I was I was down with it. it wasn't, you know, three and a half stars kind of if I was to say. Yeah, it was um, fine. It, I, yeah. I don't know if I love the story. I don't mm-hmm. I might give it another issue. But it, the, nothing happened in here that grabbed my attention. It's almost like it felt like it was a goofy idea that somebody had that, let's give this a shot. Right. And and that is the part where it has promise to me is that, you know, that's where you find whether creator and he's working, you know, he's working his way through storytelling, you know, mm-hmm. in a way. So he's got a shot. And it, sometimes that turns into something really interesting. And sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's interesting for a little while and then not. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll read it for a bit. I, I had fun. It was at least a little different thing than than uh, a lot of the stuff that I've been reading. Then we're over to Empire Captain America number two yeah. by Philip Kennedy Johnson, who I realized this week I was like, oh, his parents named him Kennedy Johnson. That's funny. Interesting, yeah. Art by Ariel Olivetti, allegedly. Color by R- Rochelle Rosenberg. Uh, letters by Ariana Mar. I really want to like this book. Yeah, this is the week that like, where I just like, I don't know why Empire exists. It, yeah, you're right. You're totally right. We're not even going to talk about the regular issue, but like again, you could just re- replace our conversation from last week. Nothing is happening mm-hmm. in that book. And then I've been reading a bunch of the tie-ins. Like I read this one in X Men, and I read Captain Marvel this week, and and uh, I feel like there's there's another one. But um, X Men was just boring. I, I don't even think I'm going to finish that one. There's only one issue left. This one was like there's like moments of interesting and well, good. that's the thing. Uh, but the reason that I came back to this one is that he's gathered a group of soldiers, you know, and he's like, "Come on, you got to help me fight," and they're just regular guys. That's really interesting. Yeah. There is a bit in this book where they're on a campfire and camp, and and they're like, "Well, why why do you need us? You don't need us." And he starts to tell them, let, "Let me tell you a story about World War II," and uh, fully engorged. <laughs> I mean, like I was like, "Yes, let's do this," and it was so disappointing. Like it was such a like like the story part wasn't bad, but like the, the art was just yeah. It was the such, first oh, panel was terrific, and I put it on Instagram. But then after that, it's just kind of like the story. Yeah, like it was so Felt disappointing, flat. and yeah. and I I feel like Ariel Olivetti used to be an artist that I would be like, oh great, and this didn't look great, especially that flashback part. Like the, it was a story about taking a bridge, yeah. and it was just the most rote drawing, and I was I was really disappointed by it, you know. And then the other the rest of the story is just you know invasion of the body snatchers shit, which is kind of whatever. I just don't know why Empire exists. I I can kind of see now why they're right. sort of dumping it because it's just like it doesn't. There's not a single compelling thing that's happening in any of these books. The only compelling thing is the same thing I would have said last week is the the Wick and Hulkling thing because we spent the whole time going, "What is wrong with this guy?" Yep. And the, but, I know we're not talking about that book, but the, <laughs> but the but the reveal in that book uh-huh. that wasn't a reveal. There's been no ground laid for anything. There's been no work done. Yeah. There's been no earning anything. Things just happen. But even like technically, like workman wise, they came in like you're not Hulkling. Something sinister happened, then there was a page turn, and they never went back to it. So they didn't tell us who he was, and they didn't even act like it was a mystery that they left it with. It was the, the scroll who was mad at Captain Marvel earlier. That was who Really? It was. Yeah. That was not clear at all. Well, they said who, that's who it was. They said the, no, because they, no, they said... But, we're not talking about that no. book. <laughs> it's too late. We have... We have. Well, I'm not no, gonna... they, said, uh, like, they said her name. It was like the last time I saw it, but it wasn't in a way that was clear like they do most comic book reveals. So I don't think it was, it was very clearly... It doesn't matter, but even if it even if it was, I don't know who that character is. Why do I give a shit? Uh, that's what I mean. They haven't earned anything. It, yeah. um, it, anyway, that, it's just been such a bizarre. Like I was really excited for it. I thought that the yeah. prelude issues were really fun, and then all of a sudden, just it was like they had an idea for a story, and they, we're just reading the outline for it. We're not reading the actual story. Mm-hmm. It's also the the idea is not that interesting. A- everything after the twist, which was pretty well uh, telegraphed, yeah. has been very. I've seen this before. And yeah, and we have one issue left. <laughs> it's like, Good. really? Why are we already, like, nothing has happened. Mm-hmm. Anyway, let's talk about Marauders 11 really quickly. This is uh, Jerry Duggan and Stefano Caselli, terrific writer and art team, Edgar Delgado, Corey Pettit. And this is a very <laughs> interesting issue in that it opens up with the funeral for Kitty Pride, the Viking funeral, because they can't, they still can't bring her body onto. Krakoa for whatever reason so they they can't resurrect her and so they can't bury her even so they put her in a coffin send it out into the water and, and burn it 
And then by the end of the issue, she's been resurrected. So we, we go real quick through the, through the oh. cycle here. <laughs> so I was actually going to ask you, because I, I wasn't reading this, and I, don't, I didn't know. I think you'd mentioned sort of offhandedly that she had been killed, and yep. I didn't realize that, because mm-hmm. I, I guess we didn't talk about that book when it happened, and I didn't read it. So what happened? The Black King murdered her. Okay. He double-crossed her. And, Is that, and that's Sebastian Shaw? Yeah. Okay. I think he shot her and then drowned her. I don't remember. It was a while ago. It's, okay. It's, a lot has happened in the world. But they figured out here why they couldn't resurrect her. There's, there was some things to do with her phasing. Like, you know, they couldn't just get her body because she's out of phase with the world. So they had to, they had to, they had to go in and do, fix her phase problem and then they could get her body and then they could resurrect her. So they resurrected her at the end and it was all fine. But... Jerry Duncan's doing a great job with this book. There's a whole subplot with this government organization that's supposed to keep their tabs on the X-Men. And, and so here, uh, Storm and one of the agents has a clandestine meeting on a subway in Washington. And just, it's, it's been fun. It's been funny. This is probably my favorite of the X-Men books still. And it looks great. Stefano Caselli is, is terrific. Kitty's great. And I knew she wasn't going to stay dead forever. No. And that's, that's best. Yeah. Probably. Wonder Woman 760, Mariko Tamaki and Michael Janin and Jordi Belair. Similar to Hawkman, it's, I realized in this issue that, hey, we're finally just getting a Wonder Woman as superhero story. Like, it's been nine years since the New 52, and mm-hmm. we started down the road of that epic tale. Really? That Azzarello and, yes. That was nine years ago? 2011. Fuck me. Azzarello and Chang told of, you know, her and the gods, and we really haven't gotten away from that since then. That's been all that they've been doing in her books. For the most part, there's been one-offs here and there, but here we're just getting her... Dealing with someone psychically attacking the people of Washington, or, and she's dealing with it. And it seems to be just a straightforward one woman superhero story, which is great. And the Michael Jannon art's really good. And I, and I like the way they, uh, she has like, these piercing blue eyes. The coloring from Jordi Belair is great. They're really striking. It's a lot of fun. I'm not declaring it the best thing ever, but it's just a really fun one woman story that doesn't involve, you know, her angst about Zeus and. Aries and all you know, all that stuff. It's just super, someone's hurting the people of Washington, and she's trying to stop it, and it's been really refreshing to read. So I've been enjoying these two issues so far. All right, I didn't read most of those books. Yeah, that's fine. It was a weird week. Those are the books we wanted to it talk a, about. It was really. It was like you had sent me. You, I think I was in the email with the list. You're like, it's one of those weeks, and I was like, uh oh. And then I was like, three quarters of my books, and I was like, you were not kidding. You're like, yeah. <laughs> so, it really was like one of those weeks. Nothing. So those are the books we're going to talk about, but patreon.com slash ifanboys, where the patrons can go vote to add a book to the rundown. And this week, it was a blowout of epic proportions. Like I don't know if we've had a blowout this bad in a long time. But the winner was Seven Secrets, number one, from Boom Studios, written by Tom Taylor, art by Danielle Di Nicuolo, hey. and colors by Walter Biamonte with Katia Rinaldi. Italy is apparently the new hotspot for talent in comics. Almost every comic this week had Italian people on it. That's interesting. Letters by Ed right. Duke Shire. So this is uh, Tom Taylor's book at Boom. Boom has been focused mostly, not entirely, but mostly on YA. It's been very lucrative for them, smartly, because it's the growth market in comics. And I don't know if this is a YA-ish book or not. Can't tell. Uh, This was fine. Yeah. I liked it. It was a good first issue. The basic story is there are seven secrets in the world, and there's groups that have protected them for centuries, and... There's someone trying to gather the secrets, and they attack this one group. And there's two people that are charged with protecting the secret physically. Like There's like a box with a secret in it. And there's like two warriors who are supposed to protect that box amongst the group of people protecting it. And they are a man and a woman, and they secretly had a baby together, and that's a whole problem. So there's some flashbacks to that while they're being attacked, and while the man is doing his last stand against the invaders. It was, it was fine. The art was solid. I didn't love it. It wasn't overly compelling, but there were good I bits in it. Wasn't super clear on the on the premise. Like they kept going back to the secret. Like you have the secret, gotta protect the secret, which was like it's like in the old days when uh, I, when I when I didn't realize I hated Sons of Anarchy, and it was just it's for the club. Why are we doing it? for the club? You know, it's just this secret, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. It's a MacGuffin, right you now. You distilled it better than me, but basically, there, a lot happened really fast and i didn't feel like i had my footing in it which you know partially on me as a reader but not fully i didn't love it i was really looking forward to it i mm-hmm. thought oh i'm gonna i'm gonna enjoy this it's gonna be a new thing and then it just turns out to sort of n- not be a comic necessarily for me yeah that's fine too yeah 
I thought it was solid. I like I liked reading it. I didn't dislike reading it. We've had these patron picks where I've been like, oh god, I hate this in the yes, five pages, great. and I didn't hate this. I liked it. The art had sort of a anime style, sort of a cartoony style. It was very dynamic. It was very yeah. actiony, and it, it captured that really well. I think. Yeah, some of the faces. I'm looking at page uh, twelve, where the woman is standing against the door frame. That that face is very sort of manga style. Yeah. The art was good. Boom finds these kind of artists, and their yeah. the storytelling was good. It you know you see a lot of indie work that's not quite there yet in this. Yeah. This work. Oh Daniel, yeah, no, this Nicola, is she's professional level. This is good. Yes, it is. It's I and mean, the style is you know you kind of either like it or don't, but you can't deny that the sort of craft is in place. The and storytelling again, it's, is it's good. It's super action. Yeah. You know, the the pacing and the and the action and movement is all really good. Yes, I don't know. I mean. It, <sighs> Obviously, Tom Taylor uh, is someone we we really like right now, and so I might be willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and read another issue. I, again, I didn't dislike it. I just it may not be. Well, okay, let's 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 game this out a little. Yeah. If the I thing remember. that seems to be most attractive about him to me, and I and mm-hmm. I'm and I, you know, I'll just stay with me for now. In the DC books, he's got a really good way of getting to the core of these characters, um, and what makes them compelling, and what mm-hmm. the thing that we know about them. I don't think the plotting, it's not bad, but it's not like that's an amazing story and concept. I mean, it's like it, we're talking about a zombie book. See, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think the plotting's been really strong. I think the. It has, it, but it's not. Okay. That's not my number one reason for showing up. So when we, we switch over to creator owned and I don't have that foothold, mm-hmm. it's a little harder for me to figure out what I like about this, which, again, I want to, like, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's not speaking to me mm-hmm. so quickly. It might be that I get there. And you know the first issue of a of a comic book of an action mainstream comic book is got to balance a lot of plates. Yeah. Do we make it exciting? Do we make it scary? Do we make it compelling? Do we let you get to know the characters? You know, there's a lot of plates to balance, and then who knows what is going to attract people. And so a first indie issue is usually never enough to know if you like a thing. Yeah, this hits the ground running. You know, there's mm-hmm. a, it's yes. it's very action packed, so you don't really. Which I know think much you have to do about the characters. So that's better than the opposite, right? You know, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know, like. You know, obviously, there's the there's this villain. There's a, there's the secrets. There's the baby that's a you know a forbidden baby because they're not supposed to have to procreate, and they choose the they choose the baby over the secrets. The secrets over the baby. I don't remember which one they did, they chose. No, they chose the secret society. Right. So they, the baby was going to be given up, and there was an attack by the villain, and I kind of got lost at the end. Well, he kills the the dude. And, uh, yeah, no, I got that, but I I don't really understand what happened with the baby. Again, not not really a fault. There's a lot going on in this, like so yeah. it it was a little little tough to follow. I just kept waiting for the baby to show up as the as the bad guy or the hero, like that basically because I was like, All right, well, because it's yeah. in the past, we really don't know what happened to the baby actually. So right. it yes. could be he could be, but I don't think it is. He would have recognized him. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna try to read the second issue, and that's hoping I remember it comes out. <laughs> yes, same. I'm gonna give the second issue a shot just to see, just to see that maybe we'll slow down a minute and get a chance to really f- it, see. What it the reminded like. me of that other book, The Excellence. Excellence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Excellence. Which actually came out this week, and I realized I had stopped reading it. I did too. Um, yeah, because I I lost the thread on that one. It felt a lot like that. Carrie Randolph's a better artist, but it's yeah, really but... just subjective. All right, give it a number out of five. Yeah, ratings. Um, <laughs> that does that doesn't sound good. Yeah, that's just. <laughs> consequence of the time of recording i would say uh i'm gonna give it a three out of five three of stars same which is solid it's not it's not bad mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i'm gonna try to read the second issue if i remember to read it mm-hmm. which sounds funny but the fact of the matter is that's just how it goes all right you know that's just how it goes so that's the patreon pick patreon.com slash ifanboy everyone can vote to add a book to the rundown but at the five dollar or higher level you get your own superpower live in the show as josh alluded to early in this episode and so we're going to thank kyle bamer and kyle is a human record player go on so he puts his left hand out he put a record on it his right finger becomes a needle and he opens his mouth and sound comes out i have a lot of questions <laughs> well there may not be answers because this is magic Okay, okay. So I assume there's some sort of shock absorption because... Well, the thing is, it's, it's, a, it's a magical thing, so there's not... The physical okay. limitations of your record player don't apply to Kyle. Okay. Uh, what, about, what about cartridge and stylus selection? Uh, is, is, it a, is it a good quality record player? It's good quality sound. Right. Okay. And the yeah. speakers, do they sound like they're coming from inside a mouth? 
Like, you mean like hollow and tinny and echoey? No, it's yeah. Uh, like, or, or is it like a really good? Is there a stereo separation of some kind? How's the sound feel? He, it's a good sound. It's not the best sound you've ever heard, but it's not certainly not like it's not like an old vitriola from the eighteen hundreds or anything. It's very, very loud. Does he have? Could he? Could he? Could he like work a party? He could just yeah. He, it's sort of like he can he can mentally lower and raise the volume. Okay, but but he's got some projection to it. There's a yeah, little yeah, power yeah. to it. He's a hundred watts per channel or something like yeah. that. I mean, it could be real low if you just wanted to like some background music, but you could okay. also turn it up. And... Uh, I had another one, but uh, but I... okay, yeah, here's the last one. Yeah. All right, I'm a, a normal human, mm-hmm. a man, holding one hand up, <laughs> and his mouth open in, in, a, in a single single position. Yeah. He might tire that. Yep. Tire from that after. I mean, if he was like a marine, he could probably do it for an hour or so. Right. But like a normal human, like a me, I got 40, 50 seconds maybe before I'm like, I'm cramping, I got to move. So how does that work? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's the physical limitation of him. Really? A, hu- a, human, so, a human record player is, you know, he make it tired. So does he like doing it? It's his thing, you know? That's his okay. contribution to the team. Like, okay. <laughs> so, well, you know, he feels he's real proud of it. Well, okay, that's I like that. I like that yeah. as a thing, and and by like and what you've just opened up the fact is that there's a team. Well, yeah, I, I'm always assuming this is like uh, some sort of weird X Men team that we're do- putting together. See, but I think that Kyle's team with this particular power would have to be some sort of specialized team, like they put on parties. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, so, like there's a catering guy, and there's you know like the chairperson, or you know like in the old days when they used to have like a band play during the war, he would just mm-hmm. be like the guy in the back playing the the patriotic music in the back, nice. or you know when they come home. They need to mellow out or get revved up before the war. Mm-hmm. You know, some M M&M and M while they're getting ready. <laughs> okay, anonymous, and I'm not gonna lie and tell you that his this this lack of a name didn't didn't. What's great about this is me. it could be anyone. So yeah, you know, if, if you haven't had your power yet, maybe this is you. I like that. Yeah, anonymous. No. Yeah, anonymous. Hopefully, anonymous knows who they are. When you said when you said it could be anybody. I thought, well, maybe it's Steven Spielberg. It could be. That That's was the what thing. I thought. It's anonymous. Yeah. It could be Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> God, I hope. No, I don't hope. <laughs> you need to be taking care of yourself and doing something else. And listen to our nonsense. Eating kale. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Low impact aerobic work. Anonymous. Can I just call him Jim sure. for now? Give him a okay, name. so Jim, nobody who has met Jim ever forgets who he is so right. there's never an awkward point where somebody's trying to like you're tr- you're worried are they going to remember me when i talk to them so when he walks up to anybody they remember him as if they had just met him including his name who he is so there's <laughs> never an awkward moment i enjoy the irony of this being for anonymous i know that's well i was i was glad for the gift that that word had given me when i was I mean, I was asking you questions about the record player, and I was like, I have nothing. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I, I've been thinking about this the entire time of the show. Here's the, the I mean, the other thing is, unless... He's indelible. Yes. Yeah. That's a good or word. Or she. Or who it knows? Yeah. It, we it, don't know. Either way, though... Well, we're going with the, Jim. We're going, we're going with the, the, the Jim identity for Anonymous. Jim is indelible. Like, whenever I meet anyone in comics or I approach somebody... To like do a talk explode or something like that, mm-hmm. you know. Like ten years ago, I would be pretty sure that they they probably had an idea of who I was, and I don't mean that in a like you know who I am, but like it just makes asking an interview for an interview for somebody better, you know. But now I have to I just assume that they don't, right? And and then there's an that's that there's an awkwardness to that because so you, you you know, wish you had this power then. I think oh yeah no it would it would make life a lot easier because if I am sure that I know somebody. And you, and and I'm sure that they know me. Mm-hmm. Then all of the awkwardness of conversations is out of is out of the way. Right. Yeah. So just just the regular awkwardness. Actually, this happens. I work for a company, and I work. We all work remotely now. But I had worked remotely, so every time I went back, I had to assume that nobody knew who I was. Right. And so, like, it's just it. Well, that was, was like when we used to go to London for our old job and exactly. go to London office and be like, "Hi, we're the Americans." Yeah, and it could go either way, like, "Oh, hey, you know," and or, or I had no idea that you existed. <laughs> so, patreoncom slash fanboy. That's where you can go and give the five dollar higher level, get your own superpower. There's all kinds of fun stuff we do there. I'm just going to run through these quickly because we're running long. FMO.threadless.com is our t-shirt store. FMO.com slash support is where you can donate via PayPal. FMO.com slash Amazon is where you can buy books and other things. And we appreciate everyone who does all those things to support the show. You all are the reason why the show keeps going. I know we're long, but I want to do an email because it's prescient. Yeah, it is. 
and we were going to do it last week, and it's better this week. Scott from Portland, Oregon. I know we hear a lot about the state of the comics industry, but I'm curious how you feel about the state of comics as a creative medium. Do you see any shifts happening in how creators are using comics to push storytelling? Are you seeing any new art trends? Feel free to expand beyond weekly mainstream books if you want. And I know you didn't ask specifically about DC, Scott, but this is the big news of the week, and it'd be hard-pressed not to talk about the state of the industry without talking about the fact that uh, there were widespread layoffs at at AT&T slash Warner Media, and people focus rightly so on DC because that's the community we're in. But you know, this is what layoffs that hit the whole media company. You know, there were about 800 of them, and while DC was gutted, as reported, a lot of people were laid off. You know, living in LA, it's a small town. I don't know people, but I know people who know people whose friends or neighbors were laid off. And actually, someone I work with professionally at Warner Brothers was laid off. And I suspect it's not, we're not at the end point yet. So this is, DC, yes, was gutted, but it wasn't an attack on DC. DC wasn't targeted. It was, it was all of Warner Media. Which also means, though, that there, there will be ripples felt in the very small and, and vulnerable comic book industry, too. So. Yeah, and the DC is hit harder because it is so small and vulnerable. And quite frankly, we don't know the numbers because clearly everyone was told if you talk, you don't get your severance pay. DC was you know, rumored to be hit up to a third of staff was laid off and whole Shoot. divisions. The divisions the DC Collectibles is gone completely. DC Universe, the streaming service, seems to be gone, or, or at least gutted to the point where it's definitely probably going to get merged into HBO Max, although we all assume that would happen anyway. Mm-hmm. And then the big thing was a lot of the high-profile editorial talent. The editor-in-chief and a lot of the high, big editors, like Mark Doyle, were let go. Guys in charge of Black Label were let go. Mark Doyle being gone's... I mean, the question was about the creatives. Yeah, statement. we'll get to that and I'm going to get to that in a yeah. second, but like Mark Doyle's one that scares me because... That guy's a great editor, and and I think Andy Corey worked under him. Andy Corey used to be one of us, and now he's one of them, a yeah, comic journalist kind of person. Yeah. Doyle has been involved with a lot of the great projects that you have been reading over the years, and this is a lot like the last time this happened was Mark Chiarello. Yeah. Am I saying, is that the right? Chiarello, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chiarello. It doesn't, but that guy. Yeah. I was trying to remember if it was an A or an O on the end of it. Oh. That guy was involved with a lot of other great projects uh, prior to prior to when he was there, you know. And it is function of not appreciating the work of comic books from a creative standpoint and the value therein. So, if you want to talk about a trend and how it affects sort of the creative medium, what you're seeing is the fuller commodification of these properties. Everybody in charge of a comic book company is going to tell you, or a movie company is going to tell you, we're here to tell great stories. And that becomes less true all the time. Well, we talked about this originally when AT&T bought Warner Media, was that people used to always talk about, one day Warner Brothers will stomp on DC. And it never really happened, because at the end of the day, Warner Media was a media company. They were storytellers, even if they are trying to sell stories mostly to China these days. But still, they were still, at their heart, a storytelling company. AT&T, at its heart, is a technology infrastructure company. They don't understand storytelling. Clearly they don't because they are doing their level best to wreck one of the great media companies in the world. You know, HBO used to be a brand that stood for something and now it's, in 10 years time, it's going to be nothing. We talked a bit about how the real scary thing was AT&T's purchase of Warner Media because that brought a whole unknown element to it. And now I think we're seeing what's going to happen. At least the indications, you know, the person in charge of DC, from a corporate standpoint, as a woman they brought in from consumer products who supposedly doesn't see the sort of the value in adult comics, and meaning that like mature comics, comics for adult readers. That's the reports. Who knows if that's true or not? And also, if you've got outside eyes coming in going, why are we doing this way? That's why you've got DC pulling out a diamond. That's why you've got a focus on the book market and trades, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but you've got people now who have no reverence for the way things have been going for the last 80 years and are willing to blow it up, you know, which could be good, it could be bad. It and and be both. It's, I think it's fair to say the people who have been in charge of DC up to now, yeah, up to now, you know, at least understood that there was such a thing as a market that depended on them, mm-hmm. uh, meaning the direct market. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, basically like DC is the second biggest publisher. You take that out of the direct market and that, you know, that'll top all the others. It'll collapse. Yeah, the stores won't be yeah. able to survive. On and there. so when you had people there, really up through Diane Nelson, and Diane Nelson was a wild card, and mm-hmm. it turned out that she wasn't the death bringer that we feared. Right. So the thing is, we don't know what's going to happen going forward. That's true. That's true. But as we get further away from it, there is going to be somebody who shows up 
And then the person who who really only sees the YA book market, which is a fucking trend. It's I mean like it's a big trend and it's important, but it doesn't mean that it's forever. But instead, everything is apparently looking like it's going in the direction of realigning to fully focus on that is a business decision. It's a nuts and bolts business decision. And so the the person who's making that decision eventually isn't going to think, man, it is important for other reasons than just profit Mm -hmm. to hold up this industry. And as long as it is profitable, as long as you are not losing money, then there's no reason not to do it. But that's not, you know, in, in returning maximum shareholder value then that is not a priority eventually. And that's I think that's the direction we're going to see. And it's totally speculation. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, comics are profitable. They're not as profitable. As, yes. And when you're in a corporate environment and your bonus is tied to your stock price, you want to maximize your profitability. And mm-hmm. maybe a, a, a division that only makes a couple hundred million dollars in profit isn't as attractive as one that makes a billion dollars in profit. Mm-hmm. And that's so sad. And I mean, I mean I, like I've lived that in my own life. Yeah. For sure. And the thing is, we don't know. Is it mean that DC is going to stop publishing single issues? Who knows? Maybe, but maybe not. Are they going to focus on digital and trades? Because that's where they, you know, at and is all about streaming right now. So they, it would make sense that they would want to focus on, on content that, that you could stream on your phone as opposed to in a store for $4 for 20 pages. You know what? I, uh, I was thinking that I don't have enough options for streaming video content on my TV. Oh, wait. I have more than anyone could... Po- I have a crippling amount of, of content. I mean, they have their streaming. It's HBO Max. That's their streaming service. Yeah. So who knows? It's not great news, and certainly not for the people that are laid off. That's terrible, especially in this climate, and there's, especially in, in this industry where everything has been consolidated, and there's, there's a lot fewer jobs, and there are people looking for them. Yeah, where do you go from being an executive at DC Comics? You, traditionally, you could go other places, but now, you know, Fox was merged into mm-hmm. Disney, and, and so, like, there's a lot fewer more places to go out, out there for senior executives. If you're, like... You know, 55 years old, you know, (laughs) there's not a lot of places to go in the entertainment industry now. I try not to go, you know, radically political or anything, and I don't think I'm doing that in this, but it's hard not to see this as, you know, as you maximize shareholder value, what you're doing is you've made the pool of employees much smaller to make the same or the more amount of money in profit, which is then filtering up to corporations and shareholders who already have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. It really is like literally you're watching a transition of wealth happen right? in a way that's, you know, in Hollywood, there are less people working. And, and while we're successful, you know, it was a good life to have. It was a good salary for a lot of people. You know, to those people being gone, less people working on making those things, but those things are still making money. It's kind of it's kind of shitty when you think about that way. And, you know, like if you're, D, you know, DC Comics editor, you go do something but the, like, okay, I'm going to call Marvel. They don't need anybody. Okay, then after that, if you want to stay in comics, what is there? There's, yeah. in, you know, indie press that doesn't make it certainly not at this the level, the income level you had before. Yeah, and that that matters. You know, if you're if you're not twenty five or thirty, yeah. you probably have a family or responsibilities or things. It, yeah, all sorts of things. It, it's awful, and it's just, this is a thing. Like a long time ago, uh, when we stopped doing this full time, you know, and I was like, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to look? You know, I thought, well, would I like to work in comics? And I thought, I, you know what? I'd be a really good comic book editor. Connor would be an amazing comic book editor. And both of us, having known lots of people in the industry and known how it works, went, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I'd like to retire at some point. Yeah. Well, one thing that is interesting is that two women were elevated to the position of co-publishers. So basically everyone in the senior level at DC is, is a woman, which is an interesting and welcome development. But we just don't know what's going to happen. And so there's a lot of speculation. Mm-hmm. The fact of the matter is no one knows what's going to happen. Nothing could change or everything could change. And everyone will deal with it as, as it happens. But we don't know what's going to happen. Who knows? There's really, there's really no way to know anything. Things will probably change. As yeah. drastically as everyone fears, maybe not. But things will definitely change. Mm-hmm. It's very clear at t is in the, in the midst of blowing up everything that Warner Media did traditionally. You know, Mm-hmm. selling off the video game division, doing all kinds of other things. They're clearly coming in with a heavy sledgehammer, and we'll see what happens to DC Comics as a result. But it's not a good sign. No. I can't tell you with a straight face this was, this was a good development. Even if I'm someone who prefers reading digitally and by trade, I still don't think it's a good development. For all sorts of reasons. Yeah. We could go on forever about why that is. But let's answer Scott's actual question. Yeah, okay, yeah, and that's that. And that's it's short. We are long, but uh, what's the creative trend right now? I feel like we're in a morass. Mm-hmm. You know, comics are traditionally have been cyclical in terms of creativity, and there's always there's always good things coming out. Mm-hmm. You can always find good books. You can always find great books. Even I think on the whole, Marvel's kind of boring. DC's in that weird rut it's in that's been in there for a while. Image the luster is off the the last image boom from whatever five years ago. That they're not putting out as many good books as they did. 
Dark Horse, IDW, those companies are all sort of focused mostly on licensed properties or just books I'm not interested in, booms in the YA realm. We're just in a period of time right now where I think there's not a lot of super interesting things happening. It's very top heavy right now because in order, I mean, if you're looking at economically, in order to make a living making comics or have any sort of security, then you kind of have to aim to be working for Marvel and DC. In fact, in order to make money at indie comics, you have to have worked at Marvel and DC and made a, made a name for yourself and then you go back down and do your own thing. But that is much less rewarding than it was, again, five, six years ago. That shifted entirely. The Kirkman model had a little bit of time where a bunch of people went, oh, this is really working, and I don't think that that's happening anymore. I'm sure there's some sort of sort of success, but you know, I think what Lehman and Guillory got out of Chu is not going to be what they get out of anything else they ever do again. You know, it doesn't doesn't work that well, way. Well, it was a period of time where there was a lot. There was a halo around image, and so there was yeah. a lot of sales happening there. There was Kirkman's model worked if you were a big name going to do indie work, and right. so that's a lot of guys at. went and did that. Sold a lot of books, and then it sort of petered out as they did. Well, because other things. what's happening on the other side is that there are no superstars anymore. And we've talked about this. Uh, I don't know if it was in the Hangouts or whatever. We talked about it with Ron. There's not a name. No one sells books by name alone. Right. No one sells a book by name. Unless you're Tom King and doing one of your prestige miniseries. Cause, yes. Because that book's not selling because of the name Strange Adventures or because of... Because that's of a good point. That, that's true. But for the most part... Adam Stranger. Mr. Terrific. That has scaled way down. Like, if you think like, oh my God, so-and-so is on Batman now, there's not an exciting name on there that you would that you'd be like, I've been waiting for this forever and it's going to make people run to the store. It, it doesn't happen. And then part of that, I think, has to do with the fact that just like in streaming or media in general, there's just so much out there that it's harder and harder for anything to break out because... Mm-hmm. There's so many new things coming out every five seconds and so many distractions with it. And so I'm positive that there is amazing work going on somewhere that I have no idea about and I will never learn about because there are simply too many things. And the bar underneath, you know, the professional, you know, Marvel DC and then the sort of lesser tier publishers under that, then there's a million things. Mm -hmm. And it's so hard to break out of there both financially and critically, because, you know, I mean, to this day, you, had, you have no idea how many emails we get, press releases from people trying to sell their comic. It's dozens a day. Yeah. And so at that point, like, you have to be, you'd have to be really, really, really good and really, really love it because you're not going to get any notoriety from it. You're not going to become Jeff Smith, right. probably. Right. Unless, you know, you, like, you could become Jeff Smith if you're Raina Telgemeier. Right. You know, that's you're you're a, just doing it outside of the... What the comic store crowd you're doing it in the bookstore? Yeah, and so you're making a lot of money. Creatively, like creatively, we're all over the place. But because of that, there are sort of little niches. I think there's people. I think art specifically. I think art in mainstream comics is the most interesting it's been maybe ever. It's not necessarily the best, but there's just sort of lots of different flavors to to pick from. It's like it's like a Greek diner menu. It's just every genre you could want. And so you always get a little sort of taste of like, oh, this is kind of interesting. You know, every week there's sort of an artist who sort of gives you gives you something. I think the writing has become super stagnant. Well, that's just I feel like it's the art that's the problem. There's a lot there's, there's a lot of books coming out from Marvel and DC that, yes. have, that have less than professional art. No, and that's a spectrum. Like for all the really good art, like there's a lot of really good art. There's just as much substandard art that we wouldn't have seen come up before. I'm just I'm focusing on the the fact that there's good stuff. But you're right. Like it, it, the other side of that coin is you know like who let this person draw a book. We're in a weird time. It's a weird time for the business. It's a weird time for the creative. It's 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 a weird time. Which is again not to say there aren't good things. There certainly are good yeah. things that come out. There are books that are exciting, books we love, and we certainly still have a good time talking about them. Having a unique voice and a unique talent and a unique look and a really interesting perspective on all those things that are not as valuable as they once were. And so they're harder to find. That's the kind of the way that I I look at it because everything is so much about IP and commodification and you know finding a way to get product out of it. And comics have. We've, this has been happening for a long time, but comics are a way station. They're not an end point if mm-hmm. you really want to you know, make an impact on something. Uh, and that sucks. But we still like reading comics and talking about them. It's still the highlight Absolutely. of the week. And it's still always interesting to talk, no matter what. This, even when things aren't great, it's, it's interesting to talk about why. When things are great, it's just fun to read and talk about comics. I had a real moment today where I was thinking about why I like something. Mm-hmm. And I was realizing that I'm at the point, I don't know if I've evolved to the point or is doing this show... But in order for me to enjoy something, I have to understand why I enjoy it. Mm. 
and I think like doing the show all the time. So, you know, like it, like a record before I decide I like it, I have to be like, well, why do I like this? And cause we've had to do this for so long. And so that's always fun. So there you go. Thanks Scott from Portland. He wrote it in contact at ifanboy.com and that's what you can do too. Get your question on the show. Thanks to everyone who does. Now let's wrap up the show. You could go to ifanboy.com and you could download my latest interview, Toxplode, with Steve Lieber, uh, which I really enjoyed. What a great guy who didn't know that he was funny until he was funny, which I think is great. And then uh, next week, I think we'll have the media explode yeah. uh, that we did uh, with Connor and Ron and myself. You know what this is. This was unlocked by the patrons, and it's us talking about stuff that isn't comics, which largely ends up focusing on TV because there are no movies, <laughs> uh, a little bit of books, a little bit of other stuff. We talked about the Perry Mason show on HBO, and Connor had mentioned that they're not prestige, but they still do a couple of real damn fine prestige shows. Thank goodness between that and... and oh, they're Watchmen still prestige right and, now, but they won't be Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually. And and what's the, the David Simon one? Plot Against America. Yeah. Some amazing stuff has come out of there in the last year. But we talked about Perry Mason, and there was, of course, our streaming the things we're watching and listening to and reading right now and then uh we introduced a fun new segment where connor asks ron and i questions a little grab bag segment at the end uh it was a really fun show we all had fun doing it we could have kept going for a long time so that will be out soon and then finally we will be recording our uh, book explode for august on pluto volume one Yep. soon as well that is the first volume of the i think i want to say nine maybe eight or nine volume a manga series mm-hmm. that i'm not going to try to say the names without the books in front of me because i don't remember and i think that would be disrespectful that'll probably come out the last week of august yep that'll be coming that'll be an easy one for people to get into because for you know it's a it's a relatively short book and a good series i also wanted to mention i forgot to put on the script is that our august hangout is happening august 29th saturday six o'clock pacific nine o'clock eastern time the normal time but that's what our next hangout is it's still open to everybody uh, because we're all stuck inside. So come hang out with us August 29th. Links will be on social and on our website. Cool. And in the meantime, you can head over to ifanboy.com. That's where you can find all the podcasts Josh just mentioned. All of our old podcasts are there. Find out what the pick of the week is before the show comes out by liking facebook.com slash ifanboy. Following at ifanboy on Twitter, at ifanboycomics on Instagram, which where we also have the best week of panels feature. Individually, we are C.S. Kilpatrick on Instagram, J.A. Flanagan on Instagram. And you can subscribe to our new YouTube page at youtube.com slash ifanboy. That's not new, but the content is new. That's where we've been putting all our old video shows up, which was unlocked by the patrons. We've been doing that three a week. This past week, we had Josh's 2008 preview of comics. These are the comics coming out (laughs) that week. It was a mini. And then we had our full-length viewer mail show that we did by Ron's parents' pool. And there's a oh, wow. cold open, which we knocked each other into the pool, and it was very cold. Shirtless Josh. <laughs> wow, that's great. And it was very cold. I remember we all sort of, yeah. it was it was into summer, but it was cooling down, and it was not pool weather. And then finally, we had a show about comics based on history. So that, that was, it's a good week of shows over at youtube.com slash ifanboy. If you want to see those old shows, that's where they are. They're going to keep going up for the next couple of years, because there's a lot of them. We did a lot of shows back then. If you like what we're doing here, if you like this show, let people know. Leave reviews on on uh, Apple Podcasts if you can. Star ratings or whatever it is that you want to do. That's been huge for us and sort of yep. maintaining uh, over the time. And we we thank everybody who does that. The social media, it's pretty much going to be the only way unless you want to pick up the phone and call somebody or just send out a send out a mass email to your friends and be like, you guys should watch this show or listen to it. They're not viewers. <laughs> uh, you know, tell people about it directly. Everybody who does that. You know, you might think it's a drop in the bucket, and it is, but it's a really important drop in the bucket for us. If nothing else, then it makes us feel really good about ourselves, and that we're we're not doing this into a vacuum. And everybody does that is great. And of course, you know, patron, all that stuff, all the ways that people support us uh, means the world. I can tell people are telling me all the time. You know, this is. (laughs) I just sounded like the president. People tell me all the time (laughs) that no, but people people tell us especially, you know, during this time, you know, the the show has been a a welcome respite for you, and it, it has been for us as well. Right. 100%. 100%. And so all of those things add up to, to us being able to do this and, and us being able to justify the time to make this happen. And uh, I'm very thankful for that. So that's this week's show. We went long, but there's a lot of DC stuff to talk about. So that's fun. It was fun. It was a weird week of comics, but it was a good show for me anyway. And <laughs> until next week, I'm Connor. I'm Josh. I know that you all enjoyed it as well. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe.